Welcome to Module 27 of Accounting 5000. In Module 27, we're going to continue with Chapter 14. You may remember in the first part of Chapter 14, we talked about budgeting. And what we're going to do in the second part of Chapter 14 is do a budget for a particular unit of product. We're going to call that standard cost. So what we're going to look at today is looking at the cost of a product. And it's going to be what we call the standard cost of that product, which is the standard cost of materials, labor, and overhead. And it's simply a budgeting technique that we use for each product that we make. We go through and figure out how much it should cost us in materials, how much it should cost us in labor, how much it should cost us in overhead, and then we can come up with a standard cost or a budgeted cost for that item. Now there are a number of ways we can come up with those budgeted costs, but typically what we do is we get with the engineers and the accountants and we come up with an estimate. The better we can get these estimates, the more useful they're going to be in our budgeting process and in our control and planning process. So what we do is we come up with very, very rigid standards for how much a product will cost, how many hours we think it will take to make it, how many pounds of raw materials, all that sort of stuff that we know that's going to go into the product, and we come up with a budget per unit. Now you'll notice that there are two things that we're going to put into that. The quantity of the output, for example, the number of hours we work or the number of raw materials we have, plus the cost of that input, whether it be direct labor hours, the cost of the wages, or the cost of the raw materials per unit. So those costs are the costs we're going to use for our standard costs. Now typically what we do is we go through the process, come up with these standard costs, we use them in our planning process, we then look at the end of the period at our actual costs and compare them to our standards. Any differences we have between what we actually said was going to, or what we said was going to happen, which is our standard cost or our budget, and what actually happened is called a variance. A variance is simply a difference. It can be a good difference or a negative difference. If it's a good difference, we call it a favorable variance, which means it's in our favor. If it's a negative difference, it's a bad thing that happened, we call that an unfavorable variance. Management tends to zone in on the unfavorable variances to figure out why they are occurring, what can be done to fix them, and try to straighten out the process. That's the planning and control. So that the next cycle, they don't have to worry about those same problems occurring again. They also look at favorable variances because they want to maintain the favorable variances. They don't want them to just go away and get lost in the shuffle, spending too much time looking at the unfavorable variances. So what we're going to have to do is come up with a plan now of how we can compare our actuals to our standard. So we get with the engineers, like we said, and we come up with some how much does it cost us, how many hours does it take us to do this, how much does it cost us per hour. And typically the engineers will come up with three different kinds of standards, what we call ideal standards, which do not include any room for error. These are perfection. Almost always you will have unfavorable variances if you use ideal standards. Most often companies use what we call attainable standards. Attainable standards have some inefficiencies built in, like people will take breaks or somebody will show up ill. But there are, they are goals for which the company can work. They're attainable, but they have to be a stretch. They're not easy, but they can be done. The last type of standards that may be used by a company are called past experience standards, in which the company is using what they've done in the past to project to the future. The problem with that kind of standard is that it includes all kinds of, of noise. In other words, people who were sick and uh, machines that broke down. So there's all sorts of, of lag time in there. So they're not perfect standards. They're not necessarily easy, uh, hard to attain. They're actually very easy to attain, so there's no reach in them. There's no stretch for the people. So typically companies try not to use their past experience. They try to look for attainable standards in setting their cost standards. So like I said, we use this for planning, we use it for control. And we look at three different things in the variable cost area. We look at raw materials, we look at direct labor, and we look at variable overhead. We do a fourth one with fixed overhead, but it's different from the other three. It, it looks at a different method of looking at the variances, but it's still a, a way of looking at standard costs. But we'll talk about fixed overhead a little bit separately from our standard variable costing for the product. We'll have to go get the information for these standards 
by going, like I said, to the engineers for the number of times, to HR for the hours, to purchasing for the cost, to the cost accountants. So we'll have to go to a number of different people and meet with them to come up with our standards. And then we have to go back, once we've drawn them up, and meet with the groups that are going to have to actually achieve those standards and talk to them about where the standards came from and how they are easily attainable, or maybe not easily attainable, but reachable. Now, like I said, we're going to do some raw materials variances. We're going to do some direct labor variances. We're going to do some overhead variances. Variable overhead will fit with, with just like the raw materials and the direct labor. Fixed overhead is going to be different, though. Fixed overhead is going to be on totals. Remember, we try not to put fixed overhead in a per unit basis. The other stuff we can put in a per unit basis. But fixed overhead, we do separately. We look at budgeted fixed overhead, applied fixed overhead, and actual fixed overhead in our analysis, rather than looking at the other methods that we use for the variable cost. So let's do a little bit of, of, of applying this information. And let's look at one of the problems in your textbook. It's problem 14.7. 14.7 is in your book on page 520. About the middle of the page, it says that Wood Turning Company makes decorative candle pedestals. An industrial engineer consultant developed the ideal time standards for one unit of the model 2CP pe 2C pedestal. So you've gone out, got an engineer, he came up with an ideal standard. Remember, that includes no downtime, no lag. The standards are given to you in that purple box in the middle of the problem. And then they tell you to use that data and calculate the direct labor cost for one model of unit 2C. Okay, you're going to have three different labor inputs. You're going to have work type 1, 2, and 3. Each one of those has a different number of hours and a different cost per hour. So what we're going to do, we're going to take work type 1, which takes 0.15 of an hour or 15 one hundredths of an hour, and it costs us $12.30. We multiply that out and we find out it'll cost us $1.84 and a half cents to do work type 1. We do the same thing for work type 2 where it takes us 0.3 or 3 tenths of an hour at $10.90 to come up with $3.27 for that station. Then work type 3 is 0.6 hours times $19.50 an hour or $11.70. Now those are the three types. We've got three different numbers that we need to add together. So this slide shows you the three different numbers. So the total is $16.81.5 for each of those pedestals. Now they ask you, would it be appropriate to use this cost as a standard cost for evaluating direct labor performance and valuing inventory? Well, no, it wouldn't because remember we said that we were basing those standards on ideal standards. So we, those will not be ideal. In real life, they'll be slower than that. There will be uh, breaks in there. The machines will break down. Various things will happen, so it will not be able to be met 99% of the time. So what kind of motivating tool would that be for the workers? So we will break that down a little bit to a little bit higher cost rather than using the direct cost that we just calculated. But it's a starting point. It's a place where we can begin to look at what it's going to cost us to make a particular product. Well, let's continue looking at standards, and let's look at how we develop a raw material cost standard in problem 8 at the very bottom of page 520. What you have here is a company that makes household cleaning products. The R&D department has come up with a new cleaner, and you have to develop a standard cost. They give you the information that you take 11 quarts of triphate solution, 4 pounds of so-based granules, you boil that up for a few minutes, and then when it's cooled off, you add 2 ounces of methage, and that makes 10 quarts of cleaner. So they want you to figure out how much it's going to cost for each quart of cleaner. Well, what you do to figure that out is take how much of each raw material you're going to use. For example, you're going to take 11 quarts of triphate solution at 30 cents a quart. That's three dollars and thirty cents. You're going to take four pounds of so base granules at 74 cents a piece for each one. That gives you two dollars and ninety six cents. Your method is a dollar and twenty cents. Your bottles are 12 cents a piece. Now you have to have 10 of them because you're making 10 quarts and each quart has to go into one bottle. So for the total of 10 quarts, it's going to cost you $9.86. But that's for 10 quarts. So each quart would be one-tenth of that or 98.6 cents a piece. 
Now that's a starting point for the materials. You would do the same thing for labor, the same thing for overhead, and you would come up with a product cost, how much it's going to cost you for one bottle of cleaning solution. It looks like this cleaning solution is going to be about three or four dollars a bottle, and that's your cost. By the time it gets to the customer, it'll probably be a cost of about double that, maybe even more, depending on the demand for the product. So that's a starting point for pricing. It's also a starting point for production, costing, inventory control, and a number of other items that we do in that same area. Let's do one more. Let's kind of pull all this together. and Let's look at problem nine, which is in the middle of the following page, 521. You have a company here that takes, us, takes some corn and they make corn starch and corn syrup out of it. And they've given you some productivity and cost standards. How, how much corn they process, they get 12 pounds of starch, 3 pounds of syrup. They got their direct labor and variable overhead. They got their fixed overhead. And they ask you to calculate the absorption cost per pound. Absorption cost means you include all costs of the product. If they're going to make 15,000 bushels of corn into this syrup and uh, starch, what's the cost going to be? So in part A, to calculate that cost, you're going to take your raw materials, which they tell you a bushel of corn is going to cost you $2.83. Your direct labor and your variable overhead, they tell you the problem costs 42 cents per bushel. Your fixed overhead, they tell you, is 35 cents a bushel. So the total cost of materials, labor, and all the overhead is $3.60 a bushel. Now each of those bushels will make 15 pounds of something, 12 pounds of starch and 3 pounds of syrup. So each pound will cost 24 cents. You simply take the 360 and divide it by the 15 pounds of stuff you're making. You get 24 cents a pound. Now the interesting question they ask is the second one. Evaluate the usefulness of this standard for management planning and control purposes. Well, now remember what they did with fixed overhead here. They have taken fixed overhead and made it on a per unit item. You cannot do that with fixed overhead because it doesn't change over time. Fixed overhead by its very nature is fixed, so you can't do what we call unitize it. You have to leave it as a whole. So it's not really very good for management and their planning purposes. It would be much better if they could look at the variable cost of the product and then look at their overhead in relationship to everything they're going to make and figure out a better allocation scheme rather than by unit that they're making. This way it's going to make your figures not be very useful. So what we've done in the second part of this chapter 14 is to go through and look at our budgeting from a per unit basis. We're going to budget materials, we're going to budget labor, we're going to vote, budget both variable and fixed overhead. In chapter 15 we're going to continue with that idea of a standard cost and a budget per unit and look at how we actually analyze that information. So we'll continue in the next module by starting on the next chapter.